wonderful students. I feel the presence of the Lord even at this early point in the beginning of the class tonight. I've had a great time, even after last night I went home and, and studied again and went through the whole book of, uh, the whole lesson of Daniel's 70th week and uh, all of this here tonight. So um, I'm excited to share with you uh, these wonderful, wonderful insights into the Word of God. How many of you at this point <clears throat> has found, just from listening to the teaching, that the Bible is not nearly as complicated as you thought? It's easier to na navigate around in the Word of God. Once you have a few anchors, it's very easy to build from those anchors. Also, I wanted to make this announcement last night, and it slipped my mind, but I have a website. It's leestoneking.com.net or .org. I own all of them. But if you want to go to leestoneking.com, on there, there is an entire church history outline with graphics. There is also the entire Mighty God in Christ, the oneness of God, on my website with graphics. I have put hundreds of hours into that website because I wanted to be a commercial artist when I was young. I was working with that when I came into the church and I dropped everything and I'm doing what I do now. But on that website, my website, I design all those graphics. I create all those graphics myself. I do all the editing and all the authoring. I'm ma making this announcement to tell you, you are free to download any and all of the material on my website. Print it off, use it. That's why I did it. I did it for people like you. So feel free to go on my website, download any of it and all of it, print it off and use it. They've done it on foreign soil. They've used it in among missionaries. And I found out this syllabus is in South America, and they're using it as a textbook. There's all kinds of things that are happening because of just simple efforts to help to build the kingdom of God. How many of you want to build the kingdom of God? You want to be involved building the kingdom of God. And there's no doubt that you will be. I really feel after last night's service, that you'll just never be the same again. I don't feel you people will ever be the same again. How many of you feel that in your heart and in your soul? Thank God. Uh, if you'd like to stand or if it's too complicated with your portable desk there on your lap, if you just lift your hands and let us pray together tonight that the Lord will once again be with us in this wonderful school session. Lord Jesus, tonight we are asking by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will hearken to our cry, that you will hear us, O Master of the universe, that you'll wrap your arms of love around us, and once again, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God, we stand on the promise of God that you will strengthen us after all of this day's activities, working and all of the activities of life. Bind us together now in one mind and one accord. Touch our minds and our hearts. Above all, let there be a spirit of revelation and understanding. We will not fail to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We ask these things in the matchless, wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> I brought tonight to the class three more sheets of material that's not found in your syllabus. I think all of you have been given a sheet that looks like this. We're going to study uh, from that sheet at the beginning of the session tonight. I'm not teaching the tabernacle plan uh, right away at the beginning of this class. I'm doing it in the second session because I feel at the end of it there will be a move of God. And so I would go through some of the preliminary work for Daniel's 70th week. So we'll begin with that tonight. In this sheet that you have been given, there is a timeline. And they tell me that they're printing this off, scanning it, and it's going to be up on the um, screen behind me also. 
But if you look at this sheet, at the top of it, there is a timeline. And of course, it has Adam in the beginning, and then it, the line goes all the way across. And um, from Adam to Abraham, it was a Gentile period. And from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years expired. And then Abraham became the father of the faithful. He was the first Hebrew child, etc. Then after that, the law of Moses, what is called the Mosaic Law, came into existence after Moses leading the Exodus out of Egypt, stopping at Sinai, the burning bush. And Moses spent 40 days and nights on the mountain, on Sinai. And by the way, it's not pronounced Sinai. Don't ever say that in front of a Jew. They'll just, they'll just shake. It's Sinai. Everyone say Sinai. It's not Sinai. It's Sinai. <laughs> Mount Sinai. So after all of that, we know about the Ten Commandments, as I cited last night. But he also gave Moses the tabernacle plan and the Le Levitical priesthood, which would officiate in that tabernacle plan. And that plan continued all the way through uh, the Temple of Solomon, even into the temple that Herod the Great built at the time and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it carried all the way through. But here in the timeline, <clears throat> 1,500 years of the law, and then there was 400 years of silence between Malachi and the opening of the door to the Gospel of Matthew, and then you have the 33 and a half years of the life of Jesus. So literally, there's 4,000 years before the New Testament began in Matthew. So here you have it, Adam, the Gentiles, Abraham was the first Hebrew or the first Jew, you have the Mosaic Law, and you have the period of judges, then kings came out of that, then prophets, etc. So, <clears throat> over in the top left-hand corner, you'll see Jeremiah 1, the scripture reference there. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, and there's something I want to point out to you. And as I was studying today and last night, I particularly felt uh, this was apropos for you wonderful people here. Here, in the book of Jeremiah chapter 1, at the top of the chapter, I've written in there, the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He actually buried his clothes in the ground until they became moldy. And then he pulled them out of the earth and walked through the streets weeping and crying. And he said, your sins look like these clothes. The reason I believe that Jeremiah probably was the greatest of all the prophets is because he saw Israel at its zenith, at its height of glory and power and living for God but he saw it totally crumble and become destroyed utterly. So for that reason, I feel that Jeremiah may be possibly the greatest of all the prophets. Here's what's interesting about Jeremiah. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. God is talking here to Jeremiah. Look what he says in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before, if I were you, I would underscore this whole verse in your Bible with your pen. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee, a prophet unto the nations. In other words, <clears throat> before Jeremiah was even born, it was ordained of God that he would be a prophet before he was ever conceived in his mother's womb. What I'm saying is this. Some people are born with a destiny. There are some people that are born with a destiny. They are destined by God to do what they are doing. And the reason I felt to cite this among you in this school is because I'm aware that there are people here, more than one in this school, that were born 
with a destiny. You'll never get to live like other people. You'll never get to do the things they do. It won't even be that important to you. There will be a higher, higher plane for you to walk on. There'll be a higher place for you to dwell in. And <clears throat> most of you know about my heart attack, death, resurrection, all of that. Here's what I've learned from all that I've been through. I had no indication there was anything wrong with my heart. I just instantaneously fell dead in the airport in Sydney, Australia. Just instantaneously, I was gone. So this is what I've learned. I don't have yesterday. It's gone forever. But I don't have tomorrow either. It's not here yet. I could drop dead again instantaneously in the next second. It's already happened once. Some people spend a lifetime living in the past. That's all they talk about. Other people spend a lifetime living in the future. That's all they talk about. And they all miss the now. I don't want to miss the now. This is all I have. So no matter what comes or goes, no matter who does what, it does not affect me. I have this moment in time, and I make the most out of this moment because it's all I have. And because of that, I'm free, and I am a happy individual. If I could admonish you one thing in life, and of course you normally have to have plans for the future, understand all of that, but don't live in the future, don't live in the past, live for the now, make the most of this moment, it's all that you have got. So maybe you'd like to throw your hands in the air this moment and just talk to Jesus this moment and worship him for this moment in time now. Jesus, I thank you for the wonder-working power of God, for the miraculous aspect of being filled with your spirit, buried in your name, God called as an ambassador for you. Jesus, O oh Lord of heaven, God of the earth, master of the universe, oh, lift us again, I pray tonight, into the realm of the understanding and revelation of Almighty God. We will not fail to give you praise, glory, and honor. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I believe that God is going to shake this world like never before. I may have told you this, but Brother T.W. Barnes, who was a prophet of God, he told me once, he said, boy, he said, if God would raise up 1,000 real prophets, like you read about in the Old Testament, throughout the earth, it would shake the entire world. Because what do you do with someone that steps forward and commands the rain not to fall and it doesn't rain? How do you fight that? The prophets in the Old Testament were more powerful than the kings, and the kings feared them because they could open the heavens and they could shut the heavens. In other words, what I'm saying here is, this world has yet to see a man or woman that is totally given over to God. Someone is going to do it before this thing is over. It might as well be me, and it might as well be you. Say amen. amen. And the key... As I've said here before, to being mightily used by God is availability. If you make yourself available to God, he will use you. Availability is the key to being mightily used by God. God never had one perfect vessel in the, anywhere in the Bible to use. He had to use what was available. I am available. There may be others that can do it bigger than better than me, but they didn't do it. So I volunteered to do it the best I can. And I'm going to go at it, and I do. And because of that, I don't apologize to anyone. I'm very bold, and the older I get, the tougher I get. Because the older you get, the more you get away with. It's really something. When you're young, you can't say certain things. You may think it. But when you get older, you can say it, and they'll take it. So I like where I'm at right now. I'm having a big time in the ministry and in life. And I am praying that out of this congregation right here today, this school, there will be prophetesses, prophetesses that will arise, that there will be prophets that will arise on the scene, and that you will help to shake the entire Asian area. Why not? Why not? Twelve ignorant, unlearned fishermen shook the Roman Empire from center to circumference and destroyed it in the end result. They were just fishermen, but they tore up everything. They tore the world to pieces, and all of Asia heard the gospel in something like three years. So, 
If they can do it, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. In fact, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, he was brilliant, said at the feet of Gamaliel, brilliantly educated, a master, probably the only individual alive at the time who was qualified to take the uh, shadows and the types in the Old Testament and pull them out into full view and explain what was hidden in the Old Testament from the beginning of time. He just absolutely pulled Jesus out of the Old Testament like a rosebud and helped it to unfold in the morning sunlight of God's grace and glory and the New Testament dispensation. So in the Old Testament, Jesus is tucked away like a rosebud, but in the New Testament, he unfolds like a rose. And in the New Testament, we inhale the breath and the fragrance and the beauty of the rose of Sharon. Paul was the one that was capable and able to do that, and God mightily anointed him to give us all the revelatory insight in the New Testament that we find there. So, with Paul's great education, with his great ability, you would think that Jesus would send the Apostle Paul to the learned, the PhDs, the doctors, the master's degrees, in the temple, wouldn't you? But he didn't. He sent Paul to the Corinthians, to the heathens, the pagans, who didn't even know who Moses was, let alone his laws. And Paul went there, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but he went there with the demonstration of the Spirit of God and power. And this ignorant fisherman, Peter, he sent him to preach to the learned in the temple. What's that all about? It's not in intellect. It's not in education. It's in the demonstration of the Spirit of God and power. So if God sent Peter to the learned and the scholarly, and he sent Paul with all of his education and experience to the heathens and the pagans who knew nothing about the Bible period, what's your excuse? That's what I'm asking. You don't have an excuse. Don't tell me I can't. My father wasn't so-and-so. I don't have an education. I don't believe you. That has nothing to do with it. If you're in love with Jesus and you've got a hold of God, you are a terror to the devil, and you can help to shake the world for the cause of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that? Can you feel some kind of excitement rippling through you here tonight? Then why don't you just, in your own way, claim it right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for your own life, for yourself. Jesus, I praise you, God, by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you. Then look at verse 8 here in Jeremiah uh, chapter 1. The admonition from the Lord to Jeremiah was, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. In other words, don't fear a person's face. Don't fear their faces. God is with you. I remember years and years ago when I first went to upstate New York after uh, graduating from Bible college, the thing is, there was a young preacher in the area. He had come there from the Midwest, and there was a move of God. And he came crying to me uh, at the end of the service. This was probably 25, 26, 28 years ago. He came to me. He said, Brother Stone King, he said, I'm afraid of people. He said, I fear their faces. He said, please pray for me that I will no longer fear the faces of men. And so I just grabbed a hold of him and, and, and I transmitted to him. I could feel the power of God go from me. I just commanded that fear to, li to leave him and commanded in Jesus' name that he would ever be delivered from the faces of men, that he would stand bold and he would do a great work for God. Today, he pastors one of the most powerful, biggest churches in all of New York State. He doesn't fear anything. God can make a way for you where there is no way. God can do it. You don't have a problem bigger than Jesus. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. There's nothing in your life that's bigger than Jesus. He can change it. He can turn things around. He can make everything new. He can make a way where there is no way. And he delights in the impossible. Mm. <clears throat> So I pray 
that God will do for you what he did for Jeremiah. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Say, God has put his words in my mouth. Say that. Then what are you going to do with it? Preach it is the answer. Everyone say, preach it. In the beginning, every believer was a preacher. They didn't have church the way we do and come and wait for someone to burn up alive in front of them and preach some new thought they'd never heard before. They weren't like that. They were all preachers. They tore everything to pieces. They went from house to house, eating, preaching, laying hands on, miracles happening. And at one, in the beginning, there was 50,000 believers in Jerusalem because there were 50,000 people in Jerusalem. There was no building big enough to hold them. Same thing was true in Antioch. It was amazing. And that's going to happen again before Jesus comes in the clouds of glory because the latter rain is seven times greater than the former rain. So we're not headed for some small thing here in the future. We're headed for the biggest move of God the world has ever, ever known or has ever been recorded because God will not sit in the heavens and take this thing sitting down. He will shake everything and he will have it his way, as I said before. Are you excited about that? Now... If you go to this sheet, back to this sheet, and I don't know if they've got it up here or not. There it is. If you look at the very top, it has Saul. If, here's what happened. Under Moses, Moses was a theocrat. That means that God spoke directly to Moses, and Moses spoke directly to the people. So the Hebrew children under Moses lived in what is called a theocracy. God spoke directly through Moses to them. Then Joshua succeeded Moses. Moses also transmitted what he had to Joshua, and the hand of God, the mantle of Moses, came upon Joshua, and Joshua also was a theocrat. So again, the Hebrew children under Joshua lived in a theocracy where God spoke directly to them. But once the Hebrew children crossed over into Canaan, they fussed, and they were very human, as people are, and they looked round about, and uh, other nations had a king. And so they wanted an earthly king that they could see. How pathetic is that? When you've got God telling you day by day what to do, how to live, where to go, what rock to speak to. Amazing. So God gave them what they wanted. And, <clears throat> of course, there was a period of judges. And um, Samuel was elected to find a king, the first king. And Samuel tried to plead with the people by saying to them, if you have a king, he'll tax your property. He'll take your sons for war. He gave the whole list of the disadvantages, but the people wanted a king. So Samuel cried out to God, and God said, give them what they want. So Samuel found a man whose name was Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. And Saul reigned uh, for 40 years over all 12 tribes of Israel. That's important. Saul <clears throat> was succeeded by David. And part of the time, David did not reign from Jerusalem, but for 33 years, David did reign as king uh, from Jerusalem. And David also ruled over all 12 tribes of Israel for 40 years. And then Solomon, his son, David's son, uh, ascended to the throne at David's passing. And Solomon also, he reigned for 40 years in Jerusalem over all 12 tribes. But Solomon fell into sin and idolatry, worshiping the groves or the images of the heathen wives he had taken from other kingdoms around him. And he fell into sin. So as judgment for that, God divided Israel. He divided the kingdom. It was a judgment from God. This happened in 975 B.C., 975 years before the birth of Christ, the kingdom of Israel was divided. This is very important. <clears throat> the southern kingdom was known as Judah, and the capital was Jerusalem. The northern kingdom 
was Israel and the capital was Samaria. In this division of kingdoms, in, in Judah, Rehoboam was the first king, but in Israel, the northern kingdom, Jeroboam was the first king. And this is what's interesting about this. Israel did not have one good king, not one. They were all just rotten. They were sinful. They were vile. So God, in the absence of good kings to lead the people, God gave them mighty prophets of Elijah, Elisha, the greatest, some of the greatest, most powerful, demonstrative prophets came from the northern kingdom in Israel because the kings were so vile and so wicked that they had great prophets, which gave the people hope because the people, though they didn't have a good king and good leadership, they could find hope and promise and deliverance through the preaching of the prophets. <clears throat> In fact, there were 20 good kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. None of them were any good. In fact, they became so wicked that in Jeremiah 50 and verse 17, God sent a plague of the lions in among the people to devour them. That's how bad they were. You may want to turn there just for interest's sake. Jeremiah 50 and 17. In Jeremiah 15 and 17, here the prophet said, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria hath devoured him, and last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon hath broken his bones. And then, of course, in Jeremiah 51 and verse 37, it says, And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. <clears throat> because in 70, 721 uh, BC, uh, Syria totally conquered the northern kingdom. Totally conquered the northern kingdom. Because they wouldn't live for God. And here's what happened. At the very same time when Hoshea his kingdom fell, the northern kingdom fell. In 721 BC, in the southern kingdom of Judah, Hezekiah was the king and Isaiah was the prophet. And when the king saw what Syria did, Assyria did to the northern kingdom, he cried out for help. And Hezekiah took and wrote out a letter and laid it before the Lord and told God what the king of Assyria intended to do and uh, cried out to God for help and God discomfited the enemy and they turned and went back in. So the southern kingdom of Judah lasted then until 588 BC. Now let's just sidetrack for a moment and look at some of these statistics. When the king of Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, what he did was he took the very best of the scholars, the people, out of the northern kingdom and carried them away into bondage and scattered them throughout the nations, the heathen nations around. But then he transplanted into the northern kingdom of Israel the worst, the weakest he had conquered in his military conquest throughout the empires around. So he took the, the strongest, the best, most intellectual, talented people out and replaced them with the poorest sort of people he had conquered. That poorest sort of people intermingled and married with the Jews that were left in Israel, the northern kingdom, and it totally weakened the fiber of the entire nation. And that's where the Samaritans came from. They were half-breeds. And that's why the Jews in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah hated the Samaritans because they were half-breeds. They were not full-blood Jews. They were mingled with all these different races that had been transplanted in there. Hitler did exactly the same thing. He took the best out of every country and replaced it with the worst. 
and tried to create a superior race. <clears throat> so here in 721 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah lasts for another 115 years. And still, they will not do what is right. In fact, just look down into the lower right-hand corner of this uh, drawing, and there's a little map there. It says Assyria. You can see here it's got Israel, and it's got Judah, and the, the line uh, that is the Mediterranean Sea, and then you can see Israel there, and Judah in the bottom. And Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. It's just a little map. So this lasted, this southern, northern kingdom lasted from, nine, from 975 until 721. So now we've only got Judah left, the southern kingdom of Judah left. Well, the Hebrew children, even after all they've been through, still did, did not do that which is right. God gave them 115 years to repent and really live for him. They didn't do it. So in 606 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar came across from Babylon and partially conquered Judah. In fact, if you go, uh, if you look at the writings of Jeremiah, uh, up, up the top left-hand corner, there's a verse, Jeremiah 25, 11. I want to read that to you. This prophet, Jeremiah, had warned the people. Verse, Jeremiah 25, verse 11. <clears throat> Jeremiah prophesied to them and said, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. You have to underscore there, 70 years. And then under verse 11 in Jeremiah 25, write Jeremiah 29 and 10, and then go to Jeremiah 29 and verse 10. Jeremiah is still preaching to the people to repent. And in verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. In other words, God said there'll be 70 years of bondage for you uh, under <clears throat> uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Then if you look at 2 Kings 24, 10 through 14, 2 Kings, and it's nice that you have all of this in the material, so you don't have to write all these notes, you can just follow along. But in 2 Kings 24, 10 through verse 14, here's what the Bible says. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. That happened in 606 B.C. So under verse 10 in 2 Kings chapter 24, right in there, 606. Verse 11 says, The Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother, and his servants, and his princes, and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And this, I think 13 is just pathetic. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. Underscore the treasures of the king's house. And look at this. And cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And in verse 14, and he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes. Underscore the word princes there and draw a little arrow out to somewhere in the margin and write good figs because these are cons they're, they're termed good figs in Bible terminology later as you read through this. <clears throat> and look here in verse 8, verse 14. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor. See, he's taking the best out of the country. Even 10,000 captives, Nebuchadnezzar, in 606 B.C. took out of Judah. And all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained save the poorest sort of the people. He's doing exactly the same thing that the, that the Syrian king did to Israel. 
save the poorest sort of the people of the land. Underscore save the poorest sort of the people. These princes that were taken out of the land by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon in 606 BC was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel. They were called the good figs. They were the princes of the land. And they were carried out of Judah into the land of Babylon. But from 606 to 588 BC, God gave those Jews 18 more years to repent. <clears throat> and they didn't repent. So in 588 BC, Nebuchadnezzar came back across and totally, totally conquered and destroyed Jerusalem. So after 588 BC, there is no more kingdom of Jews. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed in 721 BC. The southern kingdom was destroyed in 588 BC. So then, at the time of Jesus, the southern kingdom was referred to as it was a Roman province called Judea. But it was no longer Judah with a king. It was no longer Israel in the north. It was no longer Israel and all 12 tribes under one king. Because of their sins, it had been divided at the end of Solomon's reign, etc. This is a very interesting statement to me, and it's a very interesting truth. If the southern kingdom of Judah had not been destroyed totally, the king of Babylon in 588 B.C., when Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, he would have been born a crown prince because he had the legal right and the birthright to the throne of David through his mother and his father, Joseph. Jesus would have been born a crown prince because Jesus literally is the prince of the house of David. But because his kingdom had been destroyed, there was no throne to be seated upon. But then Jesus did not come with an earthly kingdom. He came with a spiritual kingdom. If, if Jesus had thrown the Jews out, they would have hailed him I mean, if Jesus had thrown the Romans out, the Jews would have hailed him the Messiah. And they're still looking for someone now to throw the Muslims out. And if someone throws the Muslims out and can make peace with them, they will hail him as the Messiah. It's exactly the same picture. Staggering, isn't it? So now, in order to continue working with this, now you can see that the southern kingdom of Judah is gone. So let's go to the book of Daniel and begin to read there. The book of Daniel. In fact, right above the first chapter of the book of Daniel, I wrote in there, Daniel did not return to Judea. He never did go back to his fatherland. He lived and died in Babylon. We're going to just read sketchily through here. There's, there's an awful lot to cover. Normally, if we had the time, and I was thinking today as I was studying, I just wish I had hours and hours and hours to spend with you people and go through all these minute details. How many of you would like that? I would like it. I really would, because you're just a wonderful, wonderful group of students. <clears throat> but we'll do at least the, uh, the, most, um, the highlights, okay? We'll work with the highlights. And you people are a highlight, so it'll be all right. <clears throat> Do you like being a highlight? I don't think you people realize who you really are. I don't think you understand where God will take you before 
the coming of the Lord. Some of you will be mightily, mightily used by God. And I think some of you can feel that from time to time in services. There's something unusual that falls on you. Something will just hit you, and you can see for just a few seconds or maybe a few moments. You can see things that you never <coughs> excuse me, saw before or felt. Am I relating to anyone? Yes, there are many people like that here. <coughs> here in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, it says in the first verse, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And of course, uh, you, have, you know basically the story. But he took out of there, you know, the, the greats, the good figs, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, etc., the princes, as I said. If you um, look here, it says um, in verse 2, he carried the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And he's talking in verse 3 to the master of the eunuchs, and um, he's asking, he says here, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes, children of whom was no blemish, but well-favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, underscore three years. But at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Well, in verse 6, now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. That's where these names came from. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear, my lord, the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children of, of which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had, set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, underscore ten days, and let them give us pulse, or vegetables, this vegetarian diet, and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he agreed. What happened was, at the end of ten days, these that refused the king's meat, their countenances were much fairer than those that ate of the king's portion. <clears throat> Verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them, in fact, at the end of verse 16, right vegetables. They were vegetarians. <clears throat> verse 17. As for these four children, see, see what you cannot outgive God. They did this for God in dedication and consecration. Look what God did for these four. God gave them knowledge, underscore knowledge, and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. I wrote at the end of that verse, what a gift. That's incredible, isn't it? So at the end of the days, <clears throat> they were fairer to look upon than those who ate the king's meat. And it goes on through uh, like this. And then, of course, um, Daniel prayed every day. Well, there were those that were jealous of these Hebrew children. Let me warn you, if you do anything for God, if you are used by God, you are going to have enemies. There will be those that will be jealous of you. Envy, envy is the mud 
mud, it's, it's the envy that is thrown at the people. It really is. <clears throat> so, this whole thing comes into play here, that they are going to try to trap Daniel. But in chapter 2, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, underscore Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherein his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed the dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If he will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, he shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if he show the dream and the interpretation thereof, he shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time, because you see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me, till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know. It gets worse and worse and more complicated. So, <clears throat> if you uh, go down to verse 12, the Chaldeans cannot answer. They cannot tell the dream. In verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Look at verse 14. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, underscore this. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And uh, it goes on. So Daniel is brought uh, before the king. In verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Out thou art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Everyone say amen. And maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days underscore latter days. <clears throat> thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Right above verse 29, right in there, times of the Gentiles. This is when the times of the Gentiles began right here. And the times of the Gentiles does not end until the Battle of Armageddon. It extends that far throughout prophecy and the timeline. Verse 30. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. And here it begins. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. And that image, of course, is in your syllabus under Daniel's 70th week. 
This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Above verse 32, write in there political, because this is a political vision of the nations that are going to rise within the Gentile Empire before they ever existed. This is one of the most incredible things you can actually prove from the scriptures. I find it astounding. If people did not believe in the word of God, they ought to believe when they study lessons like this. Powerful, powerful. So this is vision number one. So right in their political vision number one. And you have been given a sheet like this. And I made just a contour drawing of this image. And I laid him on his side so that you can go through and see how this becomes divided prophetically. <clears throat> the first vision was a political vision. Uh, the second vision gave you the nature of those empires. But here, for the moment, we're going to study about the political vision. And Daniel goes on, speaking to the king in verse 32. This image's head was of fine gold. Put the number one there and put a circle around gold. That's the first Gentile empire that God ever recognized. In fact, see, God never recognized any Gentile empires as long as there was a nation of Israel. You don't find it. The only Gentile nations you ever find in the Bible are those that entangled themselves with the Jews. Otherwise, they're not mentioned. But once the southern kingdom was destroyed, there was no more northern kingdom of Israel, no more southern kingdom of Judah. Then God turned and showed in these visions to Daniel, what would be in the latter times among Gentile nations. Powerful. It's interesting just what we've concluded, because when you're reading the Bible, and in one place you read about Israel, another place you read about Judah, you think, what is going on here? But once you understand that in 975, Israel was divided into kingdoms, it helps you to understand where you're reading in the Word of God. It's incredible just to know these simple little anchors. So here, the image's head was of fine gold. That's the first Gentile empire. And we'll discuss this in detail as we go along. <clears throat> his breast and his arms of silver, put the number two in there, and put a circle around the, the number two. That is the second Gentile empire God will recognize. His belly and his thighs of brass, that is the third third Gentile empire God is going to recognize. So write the number three around there and put a circle around it. And then in verse 33, his legs of iron, put the number four there above the word iron and encircle it. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Now here's what you need to understand. This is very interesting. In this dream, that Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel interpreted it. He saw this huge image, a head of gold. The shoulders and arms were silver. Uh, the, the, the chest and the, uh, uh, the breast were brass. And then the legs were iron. Notice it goes from gold to silver to brass to iron. In other words, the political glory of the Babylon Empire was golden. But notice that the metals deteriorate in value and luster. So did the political prowess or might of these Gentile empires deteriorate, just as it deteriorates from gold to silver to brass to iron. So they also diminished in their might and power politically. <coughs> So David, <clears throat> not David, but Daniel here in verse 34, he said, thou sawest, in other words, he's saying, king, you saw this image, 
this head of gold, the shoulders and arms of silver, and the torso of brass, and then the legs iron. You saw this till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. That stone is the Lord, Jesus Christ. And it strikes at the end that image, that Gentile empire, the feet and the whole of the Gentile, times of the Gentiles, crumbles. And then at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, there is a thousand years of peace. And that stone that was that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. That is the millennial reign, or the thousand years of peace. No more Gentile empires. The only Gentile empires God ever recognized was the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, Greece, and the Roman Empire, which is becoming restored. It's recovering from the deadly wound, which we'll study about in the book of Revelation in this hour. Those are the only Gentile empires God ever recognized in the Bible. So, <clears throat> 36, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And again, in verse, at the end of verse 27, I wrote in their beginning of the times of the Gentiles. This is what you're seeing here. 38, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over all them. Thou art this head of gold. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. So write the number one in there and put a circle around it. Gentile empire. I'm at the point in all of this, after having the Holy Ghost 46 years, I want us to get into the realm of the supernatural, into the deep spiritual things that we've never gotten into before. I believe that the church service you go to here every week should be the most exciting thing you do all week long. It should not, it should not be who won this match or who won that match or the latest car that's come into the nation or whatever. The most exciting thing in your life should be the house of God. If we get the Spirit of God moving and enter into the realm of the supernatural, where angels walk among us and people see them, where the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life again, deaf ears open, cancer vanishes, people are healed of all manner of diseases, and you get into realms of the Spirit. I, I have been, I've been in prayer meetings personally in my home, just by myself late at night, until Jesus became so real that I felt like my insides were beginning to tear apart. At one point, one night, I felt like I was going to come out of my body and I was alone by myself. That's a bit scary. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it was so real. In fact, I had a prayer meeting one time. It went on for hours and hours and hours. I, I prayed all day. In fact, at the, I didn't, I didn't, after the prayer meeting ended late at night, I didn't go out of the house for two days. My eyes were so swollen, I'd cried so much. I looked terrible. Nobody would understand what was going on. I wasn't sure I understood what was going on. But I felt absolutely glorious. You, you can reach a place in this where you almost feel like Jesus. Does that sound sacrilegious? It's not. 
you can get to a place where He is so real. I, I've been in services where I could feel God flow through me that I actually felt, felt like Him. I was in Guatemala years ago, and um, it was just amazing, the meetings. They couldn't speak English. They tried to learn how to say, God bless you. I couldn't speak their language. I worked through the interpreter. But they brought all kinds of sick people to me for healing. And there were, there were miracles of healing. People got the Holy Ghost. But there was one person they brought to me. And they, this person was on their knees. And the head was just full of open sores. And this person with these open sores wanted me to pray for him. And it was, it was repulsive to me to think about laying my hand on his head with those open sores. I, 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 didn't, I backed away from that. But I said to myself, but if Jesus were here, he would do that. So I laid my hand on that man's head and I prayed for him in Jesus' name. And God touched him. It was absolutely wonderful. When I left that country, when I walked from the airport across the tarmac, the stairs to go into the plane, I started crying. I actually felt like Jesus. That's the only way I can tell you. That's all I know how to say. I just felt like him. It's a whole other world when you really walk with God. You can reach a place in this where other people don't really understand. And there are some things I don't really tell. I'm beginning to tell things I've never told before because I feel it's time. There's a time for everything. I'm not the only one in this that wants it. There are people everywhere that want it. So what I know and what I've experienced, I want to, to transmit somehow to you. It's like I'm supposed to be here teaching School of Scriptures, but I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, what the Holy Ghost taught us in the last couple of nights here in this school far supersedes anything I could say with human words, because you, you can't be the same after that. You, you see into things. You see into the spirit world. You, you get a hold of things. And you may not understand all of it, but it's very real. And as you walk along this path, that thing will come back on you and it will anoint you to do things you've never ever done before. I'm just asking this. You don't really have to raise your hands unless you just feel to, but how, how many people are here? In the last few services, the last few months, we'll put it that way maybe, even the last year, you have had these nudgings, these feelings to do things you've never ever done before. See, there are people here that you felt that, their hands being raised. But you're not sure you should because you don't know what to do. You don't know what will happen. Because in all of your walking with God, you will go from one level of operation to another level, to another level, to another level. I have been through many levels from one level of authority and power in God to another level. These are things they don't teach you in Bible school. They don't teach you these things. But they're very much a part of who you are and what you are and where you're going. So you've got one level of operation. And just about the time you get content with that and get settled into that, God will open a door up here and you can see a higher level of operation. So you never can be, can be content here again because you can see that God can use you greater here. So you're willing to go here, but it's also scary because you don't know where it's going to end and you don't know exactly everything he will require of you. So, so the struggle between one level of operation to another level of operation can be extremely disconcerting. It, it can just be unnerving. I mean, the hardest transition I've ever made was, was, was coming back to life again and, and working with what is called resurrection power. It just thrust me in an entirely different realm. It was totally different from anything I had ever been involved with. I'm pretty much settled right now, but it's, it's still scary because I don't know where it's going to end. I don't know what God will ask of me in the end result. You see what I'm saying? It's the transition periods that are difficult. It, it's the transition periods. Once you get there, it's all right. And I'm always so glad 
when things sort of settle down. But then I've learned enough by experience that something else is coming, and so I have to get ready for something else. I mean, where will you end up, Brother Willoughby, before this is all over? With this transition you're in, what will happen to you? What will God do for him? What will God do for you, Brother Timothy? What will God do for you? What will God do for you, Michaela? What will God do with you, Megan? What will, I wish I knew some of your names. At least I can point to you. What will God do with you before this thing is over? Don't you find that exciting and a bit scary at the same time? Isn't it? Let's lift our hands and pray for just a moment. Jesus, Jesus, I know that you're speaking to us individually. I know that you're speaking to us as a conglomerate. I know in the spirit that something has registered in the hearts and the minds of these precious students that are here. So we let our voices out and we cry out to you, Jesus, I will go where you lead. I will hearken. I will obey. I will do as you have commanded. Hearken to my cry. Jesus, Jesus, I pray. Hear me and see. God, in the name of Jesus, I know the will of God will never take me where your grace cannot keep me. You will make a way for me where there is no way. Because you are God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus, because you are God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Very quickly, let's go back to the second chapter of Daniel, and we'll just finish this chapter. And then for your homework between tonight and tomorrow night, if you have the time, please read Daniel chapter 3, 4, 5, and um, 6. And it's not hard reading, it's very interesting. And then tomorrow night we'll begin with Daniel chapter 7, which shows you the nature of the empire. The first vision was the political power of those empires. But then the second vision dealt with the nature of the empires. And you're going to find this very interesting. So we'll get through Daniel chapter 9. Then we'll go straight to the book of Revelation. And by the help of God, we'll go through the book of Revelation tomorrow night. And we will complete Daniel's 70 weeks, or Daniel's 70th week of prophecy. Daniel's 70th week of prophecy is the backbone of all prophecy. So here, in Daniel chapter 2, we just finished reading verse 38, where Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou art this head of gold. Verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom, write number 2 in there and circle it, inferior to thee. Even Daniel told the king, the, the kingdom that's, that uh, succeeds you will be inferior and then he says, and another third kingdom of brass, write number three in there and circle it, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And then above verse 40, write the number four and put a circle around it. Number four, it is the last of the Gentile empires that God ever recognizes. We read the verse tonight that it said in Jeremiah that Babylon would never arise again, never be rebuilt. What's interesting to me is that Saddam Hussein declared before his death that he was the modern Nebuchadnezzar and he would rebuild Babylon. How many of you know that? But it never transpired, of course, because it would never be built again according to the word of God. And God has the final word in all matters. He is the final source of appeal. Verse 40 this fourth, this last Gentile empire. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, underscore clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided 
but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Totally different than the golden empire of Babylon and the uh, silver empire of the Media Persians and the brass empire of the Grecians. Here, totally different. Verse 43, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. Underscore, not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And I wrote in the margin of my Bible, that's where we are today. We're in with that mixture of iron and clay, and the whole thing is crumbling. There's no strength in it. The whole world is in a state of confusion. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's the millennial reign, the thousand years of peace. Verse 45, For as much as thou sawest that stone, or the stone, underscore the stone, was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Underscore interpretation thereof sure. There's no doubt Daniel was saying to the interpretation. This is how it will be. Verse 46. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. And it all started when Daniel refused to eat the king's meat, but chose to serve his God in fear. In other words, the only thing you possess in life are the choices you make. And God uses you according to the choices you make in life. Powerful. Tomorrow night we will pick up and continue with Daniel's